I'm pleased to be joined by Councilman Zeke Cohen, who sponsored an important piece of legislation that has helped Baltimore become a more open and transparent government. Last October, as president of the city council, I had the honor of working with Councilman Cohen to pass the landmark Transparency and Lobbying Act that accomplished three things. It requires lobbyists who approach government officials to affirmatively identify their clients, require lobbyists to file disclosures twice a year rather than annually, and allows for a three-year ban for any lobbyists who violates that law. And recently, as mayor, I had the task of directing the mayor's IT office to build an online portal to make registering as a lobbyist easier. Now individuals can visit baltimorecity.gov, review instructions, and easily create an account to register with the Baltimore City Ethics Board. By removing barriers and making the registration process more streamlined, we've helped create a better, more responsive, and transparent government for the citizens of Baltimore. And this work builds on previous efforts to make government more open. Since 2012, Baltimore has passed a trio of ethic reform. I sponsored a law in 2016 requiring the ethic board to post on its website a searchable list of all registered lobbyists and for the city's finance department to list it on its website as a searchable list of all entities that have done business with the city government in the past calendar year. This latest piece of legislation from Councilman Cohen builds on that tradition of openness. We're serious about creating an accessible government that's open and accountable to the citizens we serve. And with that, I'd like to invite Councilman Cohen to say a few words. And afterwards, we'll hear from Joanne uh, Antone of Common Cause, Maryland, and Leandra Pauley, a clinical social worker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you for your partnership. Uh, as Mayor Young said, he had initially spearheaded this effort in 2016 with the creation of the registry for lobbyists. And the purpose is simple, which is that we believe that journalists and citizens should have access to what's happening within city government. That when people get paid to come and lobby and advocate, that that is part of the democratic process, but that we should all know what is happening within our government. And so we were incredibly proud to partner with Common Cause, with Food and Water Watch, with Leandra, who's here, uh, on this legislation to really make Baltimore one of the leading cities when it comes to transparency and lobbying. This really puts us on the forefront nationally in terms of openness when it comes to lobbyists. And I will just say that we tried uh, really hard to get this passed. We worked with a number of groups. We wanted to do a bill signing with the previous mayor. Uh, she refused to do that. Uh, I now know why. We now know why. And so we did our own people's bill signing where we had all the different organizations come together and on the bill, the day the bill went into law, uh, we signed it together. But what happened with Mayor Pugh can never happen again. And I believe this is an affirmative and important step in making sure we know when folks are meeting with public officials, what they're going in for and what they're doing. And so again, the person that never wavered as we went through this process was the then council president, now Mayor Jack Young. Uh, he stayed firm when the previous mayor did not on this legislation. And so I'm grateful for his partnership and I'm grateful to Common Cause, to Food and Water Watch, to all of the community groups that came together to say, we deserve transparency and lobbying. We deserve a government where we know to the T, because we can now look it up on this website, who is coming and advocating to those of us who've been entrusted by City Hall. And so with that, Mr. Mayor, if I could, it's my honor to introduce uh, Leandra Pauly, who helped to write this bill from my office as then a fellow and is now a clinician uh, with Morgan State. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Councilman Cohen and Mayor. Um, so I actually first just want to say I'm not a clinical social worker, and I do take that title very seriously, so I want to um, give my respect where it's due. I did graduate from Morgan State with my master's in social work, and while I was there, I um, had the privilege of working with Councilman Cohen as a policy fellow. And so we did the initial research um, for this bill and found out that Baltimore had a lot of work to do in terms of becoming more transparent with its lobbying practices. So I'm very proud um, to be a part of this process. Um, and I think it's really interesting to note that when we started off doing the research and understanding where did Baltimore fall in terms of transparency with its lobbying practices, um, we were in the height of then Senator, former Senator Nathaniel Oakes um, and his integrity being called into question. And then we find ourselves here um, in the wake of another public official being um, called into question in their integrity. And so I think it's really important that we implement these systems to put in place to ensure that that transparency stays in place, that citizens are constantly informed of what their elected officials are doing and that we're able to hold those accountable um, to who they serve, right? Because it is for us and for our communities. And so I do represent the Association of Black Social Workers and I'm very proud to be here and a part of this. Um, and so I just thank you all and thank you, Councilman Cohen. Thank you. Uh, Rihanna Eccles, do you want to say a few words from Food and Water Watch? Yes. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to Councilman Cohen for bringing us all here today and to Mayor Young for your steadfast support of this bill. Uh, my name is Rihanna Eccles. I am the senior Maryland organizer with Food and Water Watch, and I am also a registered lobbyist um, here in Baltimore City advocating for accessible and affordable water service for all Baltimoreans. Um, and I am so excited to be here and to see this website and this portal up and running. As a registered lobbyist, it is more challenging than you would think to get registered, and it's exciting that now we have this easy tool and, and you know, a searchable tool as well. Um, because we at Food and Water Watch, we believe that corporate influence uh, over our democracy is one of the biggest threats to our food, to our water, and to our climate. Um, and today we're making a, a critical step towards ensuring that high spenders and outside influencers are not able to come to City Hall and push their agendas quietly and that that will be known by constituents, by the public, and by advocacy organizations as well. Um, and just as uh, you know, people have the right to know and are able to search how much money is being spent and by whom to elect our politicians, we all have the right to know who is spending what um, when it comes down to the decisions that truly matter after election day. So I just want to reiterate my thanks to Councilman Cohen and to Mayor Young um, for supporting this bill and taking this critical step to get this portal up and running. And I'm excited to see uh, you know, how this turns out and, and what we're able to know after. So thank you. And then Joanne Antoine from Common Cause. Common Cause is really a leading group when it comes to government openness and transparency, and they've been an exceptional partner in this work. So thank you for your, your leadership. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Councilman Cohen and uh, Mayor Young for having us here today. Uh, and good morning, everyone. My name is Joanne Antoine. Uh, I'm the lobbyist and executive director of Common Cause Maryland. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Common Cause, we are a nonpartisan watchdog organization um, that's been working in the state now for nearly 50 years uh, that is working to create a democracy uh, that is reflective and inclusive and that works for everyone. Uh, so that means ensuring that our leaders are working in the public's best interest um, and that uh, the public is able to have their voices heard in the political process. Um, we believe that um, Marylanders, or in this case Baltimoreans, should also be able to access information on those individuals or those entities that are working to influence the decisions that are being made uh, that are going to impact their everyday lives. Um, and we believe that the Transparency and Lobbying Act does just that um, by taking things a bit further, not only requiring that we know who's registered as a lobbyist here in Baltimore, but that we that we are uh, identifying ourselves as such when we're interacting with elected officials, um, that we are regularly reporting who is paying us and how much is being spent, and more importantly, that that information is streamlined and made uh, easily accessible to the public. Um, I'm sure you all agree uh, that the last uh, few months uh, have called to attention the need for heightened transparency um, here in Baltimore City and that there's no doubt that Baltimore City residents' uh, trust has been hurt, um, but I hope that they're comforted and that that trust is beginning to be regained or rebuilt as the council uh, continues to introduce uh, good governance reforms from this one uh, to efforts to not just uh, 
create a more transparent council, but also a greater accountability uh, and by strengthening the ethics board. So we commend uh, Mayor Pugh, Councilman Cohen for his leadership. Uh, Mayor, yes, oh my God, I'm so sorry. We commend, oh my God. I'm so sorry for that. Um, but again, you know, I just want to flag that uh, this uh, reform uh, is an example for other jurisdictions throughout the state that are looking to uh, create greater accessibility in their government as well. Thank you. No problem. Um, any uh, questions as it relates to that? What's the checks and balances to make sure that people are actually using the system registering the checks and balance would be the system itself, that you know who, who is registered and who's not registered. And it's, it really is incumbent upon us as elected leaders to make sure that everybody that is a lobbyist that come to see us is registered. I mean, the ethics board, well, us too. You know, because somebody come here and they're lobbyists and they're not registered, because I'm going to ask them, I ask people now are they registered. If not, I can go to this website myself and see. So it's an easy tool. And additionally, this legislation, Mark, lays out uh, additional penalties for folks who either fail to register or fail to report. Uh, we are very serious about making sure people actually do what is now required by law. Uh, so if they do not, if they fail to register, if they fail to file reports, uh, there are increasing fees, and you can, part of what this legislation introduces is you can eventually be suspended for up to three years from lobbying City Hall if you continuously fail to do what is written within this legislation, and that's a determination that gets made by the Ethics Board. And to the mayor's point, it is incumbent on us, elected officials, to make sure when we meet with folks, just check, uh, hey, have you gotten registered? Because we know that there will be a period of time where, uh, you know, lobbyists, even though we're obviously putting this out there, where there can be some initial confusion, we want to make sure there is no confusion and that everybody knows that this is now the law of the land. Explain to me how this portal improves transparency compared to the tools that were previously available. Because now, it, I mean, it's an easier tool. Um, you can easily access it. And plus, we made sure that um, BCID was able to put tools on there that's easy for people to be able to navigate the system. I mean, it's simple. And Adam, each lobbyist is now required to file uh, two annual reports per year. Those reports are accessible to you, to me, to everybody. So in before this law, uh, Lobbyists were required to register per the mayor's uh, previous legislation in 2016, but there was no public reporting of who they were lobbying, what they were lobbying for, what they were essentially doing uh, when they came to City Hall. This takes a big step forward in that they are now required to tell us directly who have you come to talk to, what are you talking about, how much money did you spend in lobbying that person. So the portal itself is a way for the public, for us elected officials, for, journal, for you all in the journalism community to be able to say this is what this lobbyist came to do. The bill is, um, it passed the council. Um, they had a, a signing. He said that earlier they had a signing with the advocacy groups because the previous mayor refused to sign it. Um, um, guys, um, I have to really move on. I have um, a swan in the deal and also have a funeral of a city employee who died from a heart attack. So if you want to talk to the councilman after the, you're free to do that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, I want to ask you a question. The FOP posted a video showing some city youth making a video. It said it was a sign of criminal intent. Do you agree with their characterization of that video? Um, I'm not. I'm not aware of that. Yeah. Can you repeat that again? So what happened with the video? Well, they had a video of kids um, in O'Donnell Heights making a video. They had some toy guns in it. 
on the city being out of control. And, uh, well, I haven't seen that yet, but um, I would be totally disturbed to know that young people are playing with guns. Um, as you know, if they're out in the uh, public with those kind of things, they could be, you know, shot if people think they're trying to. Regardless, I mean, it shouldn't have them, period. Uh, we have asked um, certain stores not to have them, um, sell them as toy guns. And um, in light of all of the um, shootings and homicide we have in the city, we don't need that. You know, so, um, and if you know of any place that have them, please let us know. Because we're going to go after them. We get back to this water billing issue, which is obviously pretty Okay, I'll, can I get to that? Can I? Sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> Last week, I ordered an audit to be completed of the city water billing system. Mid October, mid October, I was informed of a potential discrepancy with the water consumption bills to the Ritz Carlton. I immediately tasked my executive team with investigating the issue. Results of the investigation that the Rich Carlton had not received a water consumption bill since a water meter was installed in 2007. We were able to take a read off of the meter as, as it has been recorded, usage since its installation. After reading the meter and adjusting for water rates changes throughout the years, we estimate the outstanding water consumption bill to be about $2.3 million. Artists will be formed by a multidisciplinary team led by Deputy Chief of Staff of Operations Cheryl Goldstein, and it would include DPW, DOT, BSET, Department of Housing and Community Development, City Staff, and the Law Department. The audit will compare account records to real property records, compare development permits to water billing accounts, and it will search for other billing irregularities and recommend improvements that will increase accuracy of the city's water billing system. I've been and remain committed to transparency and the results of the audit will be made public. Um, I just want everybody to know that um, even though this has been going on for 12 years, my administration discovered this oversight um, and we've been transparent about it and we have plans to address it as well as addressing any other deficiencies within the Department of Public Works. Did anyone from the contact you or anybody in your administration to say, we haven't been able to get a bill? Um, when I go to various meetings, um, people will say, you know, I haven't received a water bill. And I remember um, someone saying that um, Rich Colton hadn't seen a water bill. And when I heard that, I ask that we look into all of this stuff um, because we want to make sure that not only people are paying their water bills, we want to make sure their water bills are accurate, um, making sure that they're getting charged for the real usage and not, you know, being guessed on what they are using. Um, it's, it's a big issue for us in Baltimore um, that everyone who is receiving water from the city of Baltimore pay their bills. And those who were trying to pay their bills, um, when they reached out to me, they got a bill. So um, I'm happy to know that we are doing this audit, and we will find out everything that's going on. Are they willing to pay the amount? Well, um, to be honest with you, Jane, um, I think all this stuff is going to have to be negotiated um, because, you know, some people who used to live there probably are dead and gone, and new owners have it. And it would be very unfair for a new owner um, to have to incur stuff from when they were not there. So I think we're going to um, sit down with them and negotiate and come up with um, a reasonable amount that they should be paying. Mayor, there's been some call to renegotiate the um, pilot with larger institutions. You may have already been asked this, like Johns Hopkins uh, Council. Do you favor that? I mean, do you think it's time for those institutions? Well, to pay well, 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 you know, and I, and I said this before, um, I respect the, the work of the council, and if that's something that they want to look into, in light of all of the things we will be facing going forward um, with the consent decree, potential lawsuits, um, when you're looking at the Kerwin uh, Commission, where we have to come up with, I think it's 90 million in the first year, something like that, um, for a total of $300 million. And then when you look at spyware, we have to still pay for some of those things. Uh, when you look at the raises that um, unions are negotiating, and just the cost of doing business, um, you know, uh, 
I respect the council for looking at Do other. Agree with them? Like, I, I respect the I respect the council for looking at other revenue sources that could help us. Do you think Hopkins is paying their fair share? Um, I will. Like I said before, I appreciate the council for looking at other revenue streams to help us with all of the looming budget issues that we'll be facing. I'll leave it at that. Can you comment on the Raymond Gray $8 million settlement? Well, I'll, I'll let um, the deputy city solicitor address that. Um, Speaking of Kerwin, have you looked at how you're going to fund that, and do you think the schools need to be audited? Well, personally, I, I think we need to um, look at everything. You know, I, I think um, we are responsible for um, giving our school system the money that they are um, supposed to have. And this Kerwin money is in, in addition to what the maintenance of effort is. And um, we're going to do what we can to help the school system out. And I, I do know that they do audits. Um, so I don't know what other audit you're looking uh, for, but they have already did audits, um, just like city government does audits. So I don't know what the um, question is about audits because they do do audits. Uh, you, guess, um, you can. You can. You, you, I just if the city was going to ask for an outside. Well, you know, we, we, we during our budget process, um, those questions are asked. You know about. Um, the money that we give them and what we're responsible for. And um, I know we're going to hold them accountable for what we give them. That's a large amount of money. Are you going to sign the city council's gag order ban? Say that again? Are you planning to sign the city council's gag order we already, we, are, we already addressed the gag order. Anybody that wants to come and speak about any type of um, um, settlement that they have are free to do that. But that's going to come before you. We're going to sign it or be um, I said we already have in place a mechanism for people to come up and, and, and talk about their, um, their case. So, um, it? so do you have the um, executive order that the mayor signed? Uh, um, we have it, but the city I'm not going to do it. Okay. So, oh, are there any the questions? The question was asked about the settlement, and that's what we're going to deal with yeah. right Any now. questions regarding the Raymond Gray case? Yes. Um, what, what the city stance is on it. With the city's stances on it, well, as you are aware, we, uh, the city settled that case for $8 million. Uh, we did so at, frankly, the urging of Mayor Young, who um, looked at the case, uh, looked at the legal aspects of it, the facts of the case, and directed the law department to uh, enter into negotiations to try to settle that case. Uh, the mayor was um, involved and aware of all of our steps in that negotiation. Uh, when he perceived that we hadn't offered enough, he authorized me to offer more. And so we did that. The city's position is, you know, obviously that this was a case that needed to be resolved, that through no fault of his own, Mr. Gray was grievously injured, uh, and that as the mayor directed me, we had a duty, frankly, to um, do right by this very good public servant who chose to um, serve uh, in the most one of the most important capacities that we have, which is law enforcement, who was hurt. And um, fortunately, he survived his injuries, but the injuries left him incapable of taking care of himself. His guardian of his person and of his financial life is his mother. Um, he has um, a long life expectancy, but a very um, diminished quality of life, which will be very, very um, expensive to support. So um, Mayor Young directed that we find uh, a way to reach an accord and agreement with Mr. Gray's counsel, and we did that. You mentioned that you raised the We have one more question. What was the base to the um, I don't recall, well, I can tell you that, well, I can't recall where we started, but what's important is where we finished, and we finished at a number that lets him continue his life. Jane? I'm just going to ask if the city's posture in this case, it's been going on for six years, was quite different, um, really until the Court of Appeals weighed in on this. Am I correct? Um, you're correct, but it also changed with this mayor. Um, I have been with the law department for two years, and Mayor Young um, is the mayor who has reached into the law department and said, you've got, to, you've got to fix this. So that's really what changed it. The Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals really gave us the mandate uh, or, or the need, opened our eyes to the need to do something different. And it is the mayor, uh, Mayor Young, who gave us the mandate.
All right. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Thank you.